Hello, this is Alice Freeland, and with me is Professor John Nolan from the Waterford Institute of Technology. We will be discussing his macular pigment research today, and we'll first talk about a paper published recently entitled Environmental and Nutritional Determinants of Macular Pigment in a Mexican Population. And helping me today with the questions is uh, Dr. Matthew Lees from the University of Toronto. To both of you, many thanks for participating. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Professor Nolan, in your recent paper, you mentioned three carotenoids that provide visual benefits and protection against macular diseases. Can you tell us about these carotenoids and what are the best dietary sources for them? Yeah, absolutely. So my work, um, which is now, believe it or not, two decades old um, in terms of the study of the nutrition of the eye, and as you referenced, the carotenoids within the eye, um, these are very unique uh, nutrients that are highly concentrated in the eye. And um, they're, what I like to explain is that when we look at the, the retina, which is the, the really essential for us to have our vision, it's, it's what I like to describe as the film of the camera. Um, the center part of the retina has this really a specialized area, the specialized tissue known as the macula. And the macula is only 4% of the entire retina, but yet it's responsible for over 90% of our vision. So as a biochemist, when I had an interest in kind of the biology of the eye and, and nutrition of the eye, to see that there's particular nutrients concentrated in the macula to the point that you can image them, you can measure them, you can change them with diet, and then understanding their properties, it was really, really um, a logical I suppose, evolution of thought and, and science for us to kind of study that at those elements of nutrition of the eye. And these are nutrients called carotenoids. And um, carotenoids are really, really special uh, pigments that, that live all around us. They're, they're, they're found in nature. There's over 700 carotenoids in nature, believe it or not. And in a typical Western diet, we consume about 50 of these carotenoids. But when we look at what we deliver throughout our biological systems via our blood system, we have about 18 to 20 carotenoids and their isomers, which are transported. But by the time we get to the macula, this, this part of the eye that gives us our vision, essentially, we have just three of these carotenoids, which I said are highly concentrated. And knowing that these nutrients come from really healthy foods, the spinach, uh, kale, bell peppers, and so on, foods that we should eat more of, um, that connection between good nutrition and, and, and the eyesight is, is, is really interesting. And the reason why it's interesting is in, in basic principles, I can tell you that, you know, these, these carotenoids are, are good for us because they're what we call antioxidants. So they neutralize uh, uh, damaging free radicals at, at the back of the eye, which is very problematic for the retina and for the aging retina and, and for disease retina. But they also have unique filtering properties. So they, they filter light at four, 460 nanometers, which is the blue light. And that's crucially important for visual function because um, if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, it's the visible light spectrum, of course, that gets through the front of the eye, the lens, the cornea, and gets to the back of the eye. So we have to contend and use visible light optimally for us to have optimal vision. It's that simple. And what's really interesting is that the macula doesn't really know how to use blue light because we've no blue light photoreceptors so blue light in short is a problem for the macula so i believe we've evolved to have this nutritional pigment to help us um, solve that problem um, and that's via the optics piece in one in one instance but the, as i mentioned already the antioxidant piece then um, that if you have enough of these pigments these nutritional pigments at the back of the eye you can keep the eye healthy by neutralizing the free radicals and remember the free radicals are produced in abundance at this part of the eye because of the high consumption, the high metabolism of oxygen in that part of the eye. So it, it's a very basic idea that you have this highly concentrated nutritional pigment, which we get from good diet, which if you don't have enough, it, your eye is vulnerable to oxidative stress and light damage. And if you do have enough, you can give protection against. And my own work, I suppose, 20 years ago, my own PhD was the, the determinants of macular pigment in healthy participants. And we looked at... Uh, healthy individuals with no eye disease. And we, we identified that individuals with high risk factors for the disease macular degeneration 
had a, a, a large deficiency in these particular carotenoids. And that was the elderly section of the population. That was those with a family history of macular degeneration and cigarette smokers, which remarkably were the three established risk factors for AMD. So we've known for a long time that it, that environment, um, and we know that the various risk factors for diseases like macular degeneration are linked to these nutritional pigments. And then the question is, how do we obtain these pigments? And you asked me the question, you know, what foods are good? And I, I kind of alluded to some of those foods. Um, but what's, what's really interesting is that I, in, in my 20 years of doing research, I've never found someone with basic nutrition that has enough of these nutrients. So then the question is, why is that? What are the challenges around that? And, and in, the, in the recent paper you referred to, we were interested, of course, to look at, you know, different populations and see, we know from, you know, for example, Mexico, that the dietary patterns are, are uniquely different. The, a very high carotenoid diet insofar as the egg consumption, um, the corn products and the high, bi high bioavailability of those products was very interesting. So we wanted to see if there was a, if there was a link there in that population. And we had some very unexpected findings in that experiment, but um, nonetheless, very rewarding because of what it delivered in terms of our knowledge. Thanks, John. Um, I guess, following on from what you've just said there, what general carotenoid supplementation strategy would you recommend, if at all, for people in the Northern Hemisphere, given the difference mm -hmm. between, I guess, the Irish population and the Mexican one, for example? And yeah. would that help people looking to improve their ocular health? Yeah you know, really important question because I don't think, I don't think that there's one kind of dietary solution that fits all. So I think the world has to move towards a kind of that's personalized and customized use of targeted nutrition for, for, for function and for protection. So the first thing you have to understand relates to your question as well, you know, what are the basal levels of these carotenoids in the Mexican population versus, you know, what's happening here in Ireland, for example. And we looked at that. Um, and uh, although um, we saw that the, the dietary intake of carotenoids in theory, at least based on questionnaires, which have limitations, of course, um, dietary questionnaires suggested that the Irish population was consuming more carotenoids, we, that wasn't reflected in the serum or in the macular pigment levels. We saw that the, we saw that the macular pigment, which is the concentration of these nutrients at the macula, was, was uh, um, much higher in the Mexican population. So even controlling for diet, and I'll talk, I'll answer your question in a second about the, you know, the, the, the dietary pattern or, or what type of supplementation would I, would I recommend? But to, to, to answer that, you have to, we have to explain a little further, you know, even controlling for diet, what we saw in that study was that the, the population in Morelos, Mexico had um, much, much higher pigments. Um, one of the suggestions we put forward in this paper was that it was probably from an evolutionary perspective. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's a need to have more macular pigment in that population, given the much more exposure of, of uh, sunlight and, and light in general in a, a typical working day. And in the experiment itself, we saw that those individuals at, um, in the higher uh, quartile of light exposure, based on, again, assessment via questionnaire, they had um, significantly higher macular pigment. So maybe a lot of these things with nutrition are evolutionary based. You know, these carotenoids are in plants in the first instance to help the plants because the plants without them won't grow, they won't survive. And, and so, you know, plants don't produce carotenoid nutrition for humans, they produce them for the plants. And, um, and that creates another challenge, of course, because when we farm and over farm, um, we're producing lots of plants, but have very little value in terms of crop. Right? So this is another problem for society. But to your question, let me answer it. I, I, I think obviously the first thing for any patient or for any, um, anyone in society or for any doctor to understand is to, is to do the best they can with good nutrition. We, we all know this, but I'm kind of critical of that statement because I think it's quite lazy, that statement from a medical perspective to say, do well, eat well. I just mean, I just had a health check myself last week, my first uh, man check of sorts. And um, I went through all the all the various tests that you can imagine. And, uh, you know, again, the information that came like this person didn't know that my area was uh, was nutrition, but it was like a very crude. You need to eat fruits and vegetables kind of suggestion. And, and I think that's kind of useless information because uh, we all know we should do that. But I think, I, so I think we have to go deeper into what is it within the nutrients that are good for us and how can we get enough of those from good nutrition 
and then thereafter if there's if there's a situation where someone wants to optimize their function um, or someone wants to protect against a disease well then we can focus in on the particular nutrients such as in my case macular carotenoids you know um but i think the the challenge here in terms of that the type of recommendation you make is that i believe everyone can benefit from good nutrition of course i believe that there's a role for safe um tested supplementation for the new society we live in just look at this room i mean now you know very different days work for me now with all these lights shining at me all day long um from the second i start work to now so with different environmental factors so i believe we need we need to use nutrition that we know is good for us and safe um to help us in, in in that way so i'm not saying that everyone should just wake up and start supplementing on everything I, I disagree with that i believe that it should be informed but it depends on the individual so you know i made reference to diseases like macular degeneration i think in that situation if it, amd is in the conversation you need to optimize your macular pigment and nutrition on its own in my view won't be sufficient i think there are then we move to another challenge around quality of supplements and regulatory around supplements and testing around supplements and the distinguishing between what's validated and tested and it has an evidence base on science versus what we refer to as kind of the snake oil supplements, which are, are out there too. And um, But I think we're improving in terms of the and, and peer reviewed science and discussions like this really help because we can. Uh, empower people to understand and empower doctors to make recommendations and empower patients to know what to do. Um, I will say that I think we're probably 15, 20 times away in a standard, typical Western diet from getting enough of these supplements, you know? Um, so therefore what I'm saying is that we need to understand how we can safely um, maybe use nutrition, different types of nutrition that where these carotenoids are added to you know, you know, I'm working on a project at the moment where we're trying to add carotenoids to dairy products because, you know, our kids in Ireland anyway, kids, dairy is part of diet going to school and so on. And can we give them in addition to the calciums and the proteins, can we give them active nutrients within those foods that are important to them um, throughout their life? I like to look at this type of supplementation, um, not just for sick eyes or for sick brains or for people that have a problem I, I think it's the opposite so the, the challenge is that we get ahead of this we get in front of this um, and I like to talk about you know mo optimizing the modifiable environmental factors um, which are few to be honest that we can do when we talk about disease like macular degeneration but the point being if my genetics say that I'm predisposed to the to get macular degeneration at age 60 it doesn't mean I'm going to get macular degeneration at age 60. It means that I'm likely to. And if I don't change what I do with nutrition or light protection or stop smoking cigarettes and all of these factors that I'm, I may even get it earlier. But the counter to that is if I do all the right things and if I optimize my nutrition and if I protect my eyes from light and so on and you know don't smoke cigarettes i can push out the age at which i get it so we have we have a certain amount of control as to when we pull the trigger on the problem thanks a lot for that john um really interesting stuff and i guess it segues a bit into the the next question i had was which is around are you aware i guess of any data on macular pigment volume in older people and how does that align with the values that you've reported in the paper yeah. and would there be a rationale for supplementation in older people given the the reported relationships between MPOV and the, the serum carotenoids that you've reported before? Yeah, I, 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 it's a really good question again, and it's, it, it's one that could take some time to answer, but I'll kind of give you the headlines if I, if I may. Um, but the first thing I want to lead with in this answer is you touched on something that's really important is the measurement. And as I look at more and more science, even beyond my own field of research, and with, with perspective and with experience, I see that the real important elements here are related to the quality of the measurement and the validity of the measurement. So I'm glad you make reference to MPOV, macular pigment optical volume, you know, because previous to our ability to image the macular pigment, which is a kind of very objective, reliable, you know, it has retest variability that's, that's been optimized assessment it means we've confidence in what we're doing confident previous to that we were using really good scientific techniques psychophysical techniques a technique called hfp 
click of photometry, which in the laboratory I can use very well, or my scientific colleagues can, but translating that to translating that to the clinic is a major problem because of the subjective nature of it and the variance that can have if it's not done correctly. So I, I always say to my PhD students that, look, there's only one thing worse than no measurement, and that's a bad measurement or an invalid measurement. And that's what the duty of science is to try and police against that. But uh, that's one part of the answer. The second part is, you know, is our role in the adult population. I think that's what you were asking in the elderly population. You know, absolutely. And, and why? Well, the, the older eye and the older brain. And let's let's think of the, the, the retina being the retinal nutrition, the macular pigment, which we can measure in the living person is a living biomarker for brain nutrition. So we can now measure something in all of us that represents their nutritional profiles of carotenoids in the brain. That's quite unique. Um, and what we know is that the patient with macular degeneration has a significantly lower level of those nutrients measured with these validated techniques compared to an age match control. And what we know is, for example, a patient with um, uh, Alzheimer's disease has really, really low levels of these nutrients. Maybe not surprisingly, given that, you know, patients with Alzheimer's disease, one of their biggest problems is, is nutrition and, and food and trying to even consume food. So if you, that's the thing about these pigments, they're entirely of dietary origin. The body doesn't make them. So if we don't consume them, we don't have them. So we have to consume them to have them. Um, and you have to also remember guys that like, we're all living much longer than we're supposed to, right? And we celebrate aging rightly so. You know, we're living in a time now where the elderly section of the population for the first time ever is, is a higher number than the, um, the younger section of the population. So people under the age of five versus the elderly section of the population, there's significantly more older people around. That's what I'm saying. So from a health perspective, we can't manage it at all. And one of the things we have to do is to measure, as you suggest, and thereafter where appropriate uh, supplement. The, prop, the challenge is measurement. So the, currently these measurement techniques that we do and which we use in the Morello study in Mexico and in all our studies in the NRCI in Waterford, um, you know, it's a very sophisticated, expensive piece of kit that we use. And it's, you know, some ophthalmologists have their, these systems called OCTs, optical coherence tomography systems, and they're basically image-based systems. And um, how they work is uh, this pigment, as you know, is, is yellow. So yellow absorbs blue, just uh, uh, what it does. Okay, it's fit, it absorbs blue light. So in basic principles to explain what it is, once you excite um, the back of the eye, there's, a, there's this pigment in the eye called lipofuscin. And if you hit it with a, a, a blue laser or a green laser, it'll give off a certain emission. Okay, so if you think about two lasers, a green and a blue, and, we, and if we were to shoot that laser to the back of the eye, and that excites the lipofuscin. And you can you can quantify the excitation. I found this on the web. Sorry, my watch is talking to me. You can quantify the um, the emission from the lipofuscin. If you have an individual or a patient with high macular pigment, they will that will filter the blue. Okay, and therefore you'll get of you get less of an emission because of that, it's just basically filtering it. So that you get this darker area, this suppressed area. So you repeat that with a green, which is not a uh, green laser, which is not influenced by the yellow macular pigment. And that's kind of your baseline for that subject. So that's why we can validate the, the assessment. Um, and you digitally subtract one from the other. Essentially, you can quantify um, the amount of macular pigment based on uh, filtration. So we worked with an organization in Germany called Heidelberg Engineering, which provided, in my view, a Rolls Royce uh, OCT system. And what I say uh, sometimes in my lectures is that, you know, I, I bought a Rolls Royce to use the air conditioning <laughs> because I don't like while I'm interested in imaging the retina and everything that an OCT does, I'm really using it just to measure macular pigment, you know, because that's our currency of, of research. Um, so I hope I've answered your question, which is like, is there a role for measurement? Yes. If it's right, we're not quite there yet, I think, in terms of translating it to the clinic. I think it's almost ready for it to be to be done. What I'd say to eye care professionals is that, you know, be very cautious of these kind of crude, subjective macular pigment measurement systems that are out there. They are out there. <laughs> it's a big, big industry. Um, so be, be very careful with that. 
Um, but I, my, my vision and my dream is to, is to do these type of measurements in the clinic routinely as part of basic eye care, as part of basic ophthalmology. And I think that will happen. And I think even without that, though, doctors can draw great value from the body of scientific evidence, which my lab and other laboratories, great laboratories from across the world have, have, have collected to give confidence into the, the safety of this natural derived carotenoid pigment. Um, and I, I think it's important I say to you that, you know, these pigments, I, I mentioned the foods that we can, you know, the foods that have these colors are these carotenoids. That's, uh, that's why they have the colors. It's because of these carotenoids, they're pigments. Um, you know, these, how we've sourced them in our interventional studies is from an, an organization, Industrial Organica, from Mexico, actually, where they were able to provide formulations of these nutrients, um, which are purified. Um, and which are highly concentrated and which allow us really change the pigment in, in a relatively short period of time. And that's why we've had so much success in demonstrating the effectiveness and the eff efficacy in the different populations that we've been working with. Thanks a lot, John. You actually answered my next question as well. I wanted a bit more detail on the, the kit you were using and the technique. Yeah. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Appreciate it. No problem. Resident Olin, can you maybe also tell us a little bit about your current research and maybe the project your group is working on and um, what, or also what, what is next for you? Yeah, thank you. Um, for sure. We, we, you know, we, for many years, we actually tr spent time specializing and optimizing how we measure vision and how we measure macular pigment. I will say we spent 10 years perfecting how we wanted to do that. And ultimately, um, we won and I won an ERC grant to 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 realize my big idea, if you like, which was can we with safe supplementation give all of us a better visual experience? Can we create a new standard of vision? That was the claim in the grant. And that's been successful. And then we tested that idea in patients with macular degeneration. And we demonstrated that, you know, 75% sent of visual function tests that we measured got, got significantly better. In a disease where they normally drop, we changed the direction. So we have a, one of the challenges is uh, education and uh, informing regulatory and um, so on about the need to do this as opposed to waiting to a situation that we wait in medicine for patients to be very sick, unfortunately, before we do provide a solution. I mean, this is across medicine, unfortunately. Let's just call it out because that's what happens. You know, it's wait till it gets so bad before I can, for example, macular degeneration inject you with an anti-VEGF therapy. And while anti-VEGF therapy is remarkably successful, I'm very complimentary of it, it doesn't fix the problem of this disease. It, that's for a small percentage of people with this condition. So uh, my, my passion is to kind of um, continue research to identify ways to kind of sh show the need to do this at earlier stage of the disease and even in the healthy population. That's really something. We've also, as I've alluded to in kind of um, some of my answers to Matt, you know, we've also connected remarkably these pigments to the brain and cognitive functions. And we've had a series of clinical trials now, one just published yesterday in clinical nutrition, um, demonstrating, uh, you know, the memory enhancing effects of these carotenoids when optimized. Um, so we're really, really pleased, um, pleased with that. So I, if you like, I suppose we've, we've delivered a lot of really uh, clear data for visual function for disease like macular degeneration, cognitive function, and now disease like Alzheimer's disease. So that's exciting. I do think we need to find a way to move towards kind of a multi-centered approach in, in that um, I'm also very interested in our work on um, how we accurately assess visual functions and beyond the world of what eye care typically uses, which is acuities. So you'll, you'll realize when you go to an eye doctor, he or she will sit you in a chair, make you look at black letters on a white background, and they'll see how far down you can go. And that's measuring your best corrected visual acuity. They'll put lenses in front of you to try and optimize that. But that's measuring your visual experience with 100% contrast, which is not real life visual experience. So you're missing about 90% of the spatial visual world in what's going on. And we've, we've seen this in our research. If, if, if I only used acuities in my measurements, I'd be missing most of the very interesting data that, that we've been getting. So one of the things we like to do is measure contrast sensitivity, which is kind of um, 
it's like looking around, there's all different contrasts. And this is really a better measure of visual function. And it correlates with how I feel about my vision. So specializing in how we assess that, we have a, we have a virtual reality project um, running at the moment where we've been able to implement these into VR headsets. So we can standardize. And again, back to my, my passion of having like a very valid measurement. I think we're, we're really do, doing nice work. There's still a bit to go, but um, I think that's going to be the future. Um, and I'm also ex exceptionally interested in uh, the mechanisms around these carotenoids. I spoke briefly about antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, which are well established, well discussed. But I actually think that um, understanding inflammation is um, something that's really important uh, to general health and to human health and how nutrition and dietary patterns play into to, to reducing inflammation. So my work with my colleagues for the next few months will be to get a grant ready, um, which we're submitting in April, hopefully for Horizon Europe. And it's based on using these carotenoids and inflammation. We also have a couple of really exciting projects running with collaborators. Um, we have a project out of Singapore where we're looking at the impact of these carotenoids on visual functions for athletes, um, Olympi Olympic athletes in shooting and so on. Um, so it's it's kind of that high performance level visual experience and um yeah we're just we just love what we do we just love the you know the study of these pigments and, and the fact what's unique about these pigments from a medicine perspective not I'm not claiming that they're medicine by the way but in terms of the 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 benefits and and the reward they can help it in medicine is that it can and should be very affordable for all of us to have access to it I mean going back to my issue with macular degeneration and we wait for this. 80, 90 year old patient to have to come in 10 times a year for an injection. Like those injections are two and a half thousand euros per injection, per eye every time. And, you know, that's why I've really lobbied quite a bit with government to try and let them understand th that they need to regulate better around food supplements, but they need to reward supplements that have a scientific evidence base. And they need, and there is this, area of kind of food for special medical purposes that I've seen but you know it's 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 the Im, I get the importance of regulatory but I believe regulatory needs to look at this in a different way to deliver so we need to translate science better to medicine for the stakeholders to benefit from which are the patients the taxpayer if you like um as opposed to it you know because why does why do scientists get so oh, I've published a paper and such and that's great and it is good and I still like it today but really, it's only important science if it's translated into use in some way, whether that's in a technology or whether that's in, you know, in our case, in helping people's functions and their health. I think that's really a goal for me. And uh, to the final element of my answer to my question would be that um, the exciting thing for me now in terms of where I'm going is to <laughs> maybe work a little bit less and support the brilliant scientists that, are, that I work with. Um, who are just you know super people in terms of the multidisciplinary effort. We run an international conference. Well, I run an international conference called the Bond Conference in Cambridge, down in College Cambridge, and um, it's a very specialised group of scientists. Uh, we all have a, an interest, passion in lifestyle and nutrition, particular interest in carotenoids, omega three fatty acids, eye and brain, and um, you know this 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 was made part. There's a foundation we worked with in the UK called the Howard Foundation, and um, they, my previous work with Dr. Alan Howard, who unfortunately passed last year, um, we were able to kind of establish this network and it's gone from strength to strength and the, the collaboration piece and, you know, the around that and it's just so, so fruitful in terms of our ability to progress science at the rate that we've been able. And I think the final comment I'll make is that we will be a complement to science in our field is that because of the technologies that that other brilliant scientists have made available to us, we've been able to do so much more in a shorter period of time than I could have ever imagined. You know, I'm, I'm a biochemist and I remember using HPLC, which 80% of my work was an Agile 1090 system. It was 80% of my time was trying to make it work. <laughs> it was downtime. Whereas now I see all the PhDs, they're spoiled. You know, these systems work so well, so quickly, resolutions are so good. But that's brilliant because we learn so much more, much quicker. And I think society ultimately benefits. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. And um, let me wish you and your, your group all the very best with your further research. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye.